Awesome. All right. So let's get started. So in college, I had a professor announce in our first discrete mathematics course that he was going to teach us how to count. And that counting would be the hardest thing we would learn in that class. So as naive college students, we thought he was cuckoo. <laughs> counting hard, you know, ridiculous. Well, we learned pretty quickly how bloody accurate that statement was. Counting indeed was the hardest thing we learned, despite the fact that we thought we already knew how. So like counting, communication is hard, and we constantly get it wrong. It's easy to dismiss getting better at communication because we do it every day, so how bad can we be at it? When things go wrong, communication is one of the last things we tend to blame for why things went wrong. We usually assume it was a server issue or a code mishap or that we had run into a lot of problems or that you know, developing we, can't, we um, had issues and that's why the deadline was missed. But if we had communicated those mishaps up front and why they happened and the impact they had on that delivery, they would have, you know, things going truly wrong would happen much less frequently. And then when things go right, we rarely attribute good communication as to the reason why things are going well. So nearly every problem I've encountered in software can be traced back to a communication mishap, a simple misunderstanding or perhaps a misspoken phrase. So whatever it was, a small tweak would have avoided the problem altogether. So communication on its own is kind of a huge topic and one that would take probably countless 40 minute time slots to talk about. So this talk is gonna focus on five tips that will make the most impact on your life. My goal is for you to be able to leave here armed with these five tips and have them improve your communication and positively impact your relationship with others immediately. So every example we'll walk through has a foundation in the real world. This is to ensure that they're relatable and understandable and whenever possible they are rooted in conversations that happen as developers. That said, there will be some difficult mental health topics and the occasional use of profanity. And if you've never seen Harry Potter, this is your, your warning. <laughs> and in the theme of Harry Potter, we're going to be joined by two hedgehogs, Ron and Harry. <laughs> and um, Harry, as the talk suggests, is the one that's learning how to communicate. And Ron will be playing all the other roles as necessary. And when both are on the slide, Harry will be denoted by the lightning bolt scar on his head. So without further ado, these are the tips that we're going to talk about. Think, then speak, drop the knots, drop the jests, and watch your phrasing, and praise in public, critique in private. So hi, my name is Laura. I am a software engineer by day, a business owner by night, and an animal lover always. And if you do a Twitter thing and like to see pictures of hedgehogs and other cute animals, and you read funny things my husband says, and the occasional tech or mental health topic, you can find me at Laura Trev. And for some examples of furry animals you see, um, that is my dog, Jackie, and my hedgehog, Princess Katana. Why, well, you want me to go back? <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so tip number one, think then speak. So speaking without thinking can cause all manners of problems. You may let slip a secret or say something inappropriate in front of children or bad mouth someone in front of their best friend. So when you bypass the thinking and dive right into speech, you do something I like to call word vomit. Basically, you spew out whatever comes to mind first, regardless of what consequences may follow. And in the digital age with Slack and other editable messaging platforms, we've only exasperated the problem. We can edit our messages on the fly, changing that history to become more favorable for us. This unfortunately is unavailable in spoken communication, and yet, because of how frequently we edit our asynchronous messaging, our spoken tends to show a very more unfavorable side. So taking a moment to think before you communicate is a foundation of all good, understandable communication. The moment it takes to consider what was said and to consider what to say removes that word vomit. And you will say what you mean, mean what you say, and be understood as it was meant to. All of the other tips we'll talk about will build on this. So there are three questions you can ask yourself before you communicate. These questions are purposely designed to halt your mouth long enough to avoid saying something you'll regret. First is, what do you want to say? This is intended, this is the intended outcome or point of what you'd like to get across. And then you wanna ask yourself who you are talking to. Knowing who you're talking to is important as it directly affects question number three, which is how should you explain it? How can you phrase your inquiry or message to be best received by the person you're conversing with. 
So as an example, let's say you need to take a day off last minute, but your team is pushing towards a really big upcoming deadline. So you go through these three questions, what do you want to say? Well, you want to take time off. And who are you talking to? Well, you're talking to your boss. And how should you explain it? Probably carefully. Your boss is anxious about the deadline and time off, especially last minute time off, may be taken poorly. So there's still, you can still ask for that time off, but you also want to add in reassurances for how you'll ensure your work will get done and on schedule prior to your taking that time off. So these questions may seem verbose and cumbersome to need to go over it every single time you want to communicate, and I get that. But practicing these questions over and over again, even in written communication and in your spoken communication, you'll eventually be able to do this by rote. So stopping to think first can help you avoid sharing something in private or that is not yours to share. So in Harry Potter, Hagrid had a lot of trouble keeping secrets to himself and spent much of the first movie saying things that should have been kept secret, especially from Harry, Ron, and Hermione. For example, he told them that the secret his three-headed dog Fluffy was guarding was between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Fromel. He immediately realized he let out a secret by saying Nicholas Fromel and turned away muttering his regret. Or later, while he was attempting to hatch a dragon name that he found from or got from a stranger, he claimed that all of the other protections that were guarding that stone were pointless because no one but him and Dumbledore knew how to get past his dog. While less of us slip up, it was still a giveaway that there were other spells and enchantments that were guarding that stone. And so when Harry started questioning how Haggard got that dragon egg, and what happened to show up in his stranger's pocket, he confronted Haggard about it. And then Haggard let slip that he told that complete stranger how to get past that dog by playing him a bit of music and he falls straight to sleep. So if Haggard had taken a moment to think about who he was talking to, there's a good chance he would have stopped himself from telling Harry, Ron, and Hermione their secrets. There's also a good chance they would have thought through his decision to tell a complete stranger how to get past the dog that was currently guarding a really important stone. So furthermore, Haggard regretted what he said. So pausing, before to think, pausing to think about what he was going to say before would have saved him a lot of that regret. So other times you may say things that you regret are when you're angry or otherwise emotional. And those words come out, the words that come out are ones that you often will regret later once those emotions wear off. So take that moment to think before responding and you'll avoid saying something you'll regret later. So Professor McGonagall was brilliant at thinking on her feet and filtering her thoughts and phrasing. Her statements perfectly for whom she was talking to. And this was especially true when she was speaking to Professor Umbridge, the cruel evil professor who's wearing pink um, in Harry's fifth year. So when Umbridge fired Professor Trelawney and was attempting to banish her from the castle, Professor McGonagall was found comforting her colleague. And seeing this, Umbridge inquired, is there something you would like to say, dear? And McGonagall responded by literally saying nothing that would invoke a serious reaction from Umbridge, all while continue, continuing to comfort Professor Trelawney. Or when Professor Umbridge then attempted to undermine her in a class inspection, uh, Umbridge was literally, or McGonagall was literally having none of it. After their first interruption, she told Umbridge that she indeed got her notice, otherwise she would have asked why she was in her classroom. After the second one, she asked if Umbridge needed a cough drop. And after the third interruption, her reply was straight to the point and shut Umbridge right up. So tip two is drop the knots. So dropping the knots and negatives and denials out of your speech is probably one of the more straightforward tips we're going to talk about. In that moment, you're thinking before you speak. You can look at how you, uh, you're about to phrase those responses and drop those knots. So one of my favorite pastimes is to chain watch videos on YouTube. So occasionally I'll get through a chain of videos that our kids doing or saying ridiculous things. So one example that comes to mind is where a kid was playing quietly in another room while the mother rests on the couch. And after some time, the mother realized that things are just a little bit too quiet and inquires, what are you doing? And the kid responds, I am not eating crayons. And with that, the mom leaps off the sofa, bolts to the room to find the walls covered in drawings and half-eaten crayons strewn across the carpet. So we find this hilarious because it's so relatable. We knew that kid was eating those crayons simply because of how he answered that question. Rather than answering that he was coloring, they answered with a denial. I'm not eating crayons. Unfortunately, kids are pretty naive when it comes to communication. So denying when asking, well, denying when asked a question is tantamount to admitting guilt, which is exactly what happened. Knots reveal truth. 
When you deny something, others will automatically seek that truth behind your statement. And chances are, your denial speaks more truth than answering that question directly. So if you drop the word not out of the kid's response, what are you left with? I'm eating crayons. And that kid was definitely eating those crayons. So when you watch these videos or read these stories about kids misbehaving, there's a general theme. Kid does wrong. Adult is in another room. Kid is a little too quiet. Adult inquires what kid is doing. Kid responds by denying they're doing. And adult immediately assumes that kid is doing what they're denying. And unfortunately, this theme is prevalent even in our communication as adults. When we ask a question, we often reach for denial rather than simply answering that question. And in general, a tendency is to communicate in various forms of negatives. So we state the lack of something, we deny things, we say no, and we skirt responsibility. All of these contribute to how we are perceived. Negatives are harder to parse and even harder to parse when they're stacked. I can't find my keys nowhere. Or I'm not doing nothing wrong. So speaking in negatives increases the complexity involved in understanding what is being said, which leads to people misunderstanding you. It's a short hop to realizing that negatives are one of the reasons why we feel so misunderstood. That said, knots do still have a place in the world. There are times that using the negative is the more appropriate and understandable response. So if you go into a store and ask for an item that's out of stock, you want that sales rep to tell you that they don't have any in stock. Any other answer will be frustrating and annoying. So if you're asked a direct question, answer it directly, even if you're saying no. So here's some examples of nods that we should be dropping. That's not possible, or it's sibling, we can't do that. Our common refrains when we are presented with an impossible deadline or a feature request that is so absurdly out of scope that our gut reaction just says we can't do that or it isn't possible. If you do this often, you'll find that people will feel you're unreceptive to their needs or difficult to work with or just plain rude. So the issues with these statements is that while they're true, they're only partially correct, right? Because that deadline's gonna come and go, whether, you know, it's just, that's how time works. So rather than saying that it's not possible, focus instead on what is possible by that deadline. And this kind of language opens up a conversation that allows both parties to contribute and come to an agreement. Or for those massive features that are out of scope for that system, you can be honest about it and tell them it'll take time. And then offer to break down that feature to see what the actual need is. This is important because it shows that you're willing to work with them to find a solution that meets their needs. And this exercise often uncovers a better solution to solve the problem that the users were having in the first place. So with these rephrases, you show you are receptive to their input and ideas and you're willing to work with them to find a satisfactory solution. And that's not my job comes up a lot when we're asked to do something that is outside our so-called job description. So in this example, it may be easiest for Harry to dismiss this request because he knows it's someone else's responsibility. But what happens if Ron thought it was Harry's job? Or if Ron doesn't know who to ask and Harry was the logical person to ask? So dismissing these requests can have an unintended side effect of creating a negative perception of you. And you may earn a reputation for being unhelpful or a slacker or that you can't or won't do your job. Instead, you can point out who does do that job and then offer to ping them and create that connection. Not my problem is a common refrain when you're trying to skirt responsibility. In this case, there are two primary ways that this can be interpreted. The first is when it is Harry's problem and he's skirting responsibility because he'd rather be doing something else. Or it is someone else's problem, but Harry, it still affects Harry because he uses that same build. So either way, skirting responsibility is perceived poorly by others. So take a moment and focus on the problem and help anyway. They'll think you're helpful and even if you're unable to solve that problem, they'll be appreciative of your effort. Of course, there'll be times that the problem really is in someone else's court. If you find yourself in this type of situation, you can do two things. You can point that person to someone who can help or you can sit down and be their rubber duck and help them troubleshoot the issue anyway. Either way, you'll find that your teammates appreciate you and your willingness to help. And lastly, not now, is the ever refrain of a busy developer. Every other example we've walked through has assumed that Harry has stopped whatever he is doing to help. And this is an unreasonable assumption. Everyone needs that flow time or the uninterrupted time. And stopping what you're doing can be detrimental to your productivity. 
And unfortunately, there are times you are going to be interrupted and lose your train of thought in a cloud of smoke. And when this happens, try not to lash out and remain composed. Instead, let them know that you are heads down and in the flow. People inherently, under that, I under, inherently understand the idea of being in the zone, so they'll be receptive to it. And avoiding that lash out lets let them know that you're willing to help even if it has to wait until later. And there are some companies that have policies in place to ensure flow time remains uninterrupted. So for example, we have a rule that if you have headphones on both ears, you're considered to be in do not disturb mode. So tip number three is drop the jests. So just as much as we are prone to using ne speaking in negatives, we're also prone to using jests. There are three different types of jests that we need to drop. The elitist jest, the diffident jest, and the diminutive jest. So the elitist jest is the one that we use when we might feel superior or impatient or the subject matter is like beneath our notice or even our focus. This is especially prevalent that I found in pull requests or when people are asking questions that you might find a little bit dumb. And I find that when this jest is in question form, people tend to justify their use of it, but it's still an elitist jest. So you can see this phrase, why don't you just, spotted in non-question forms such as just do this or just do that, or you can just. All of these imply that you're too impatient to look through the work and figure out how they actually did it, or that you're too busy to dig in and understand their approach. You end up telling them how you would do it rather than teaching, and you're dictating rather than showing. Instead, dig into what they did. Open up your mind and learn something new. Oftentimes, what they did is completely new and interesting. And if you always do things in the old way, you are going to miss out on learning it from your peers and growing yourself. And sometimes what was done was actually confusing. So take a time to, dig, uh, to ask about it. Dig into the intent behind the change. Ask them for their reasoning for doing it the way they did, and it'll clue you in into their thought process. And you'll be better equipped to answer questions and to help them move forward. And if their approach will ultimately cause problems or bottlenecks or performance issues, you can let them know, but also explain why. Take the extra time to teach them why their approach can cause issues so they'll be better equipped to avoid it in the future. So validate their work. By removing that elitist just, you create and promote a safe culture of learning and growth for everyone. And when necessary, offer that alternative but, and suggest changes, but avoid correcting by telling. Showing them the way forward and giving them room to figure it out on their own and lead when necessary and be kind while you do it. The diffident just, or another word is a comparison just, is a just used when you lack self-confidence and detract from your own accomplishments, especially in the wake of someone else's seemingly bigger accomplishment. This is important to note that diffident differs from being humble. Uh, someone who is humble uses unassuming, unpretentious language to describe their accomplishments, whereas someone who is diffident uses language that purposely talks down and detracts from their own abilities or skills or powers. You'll find this just frequently in comparisons, but you'll also find them when someone is struggling with imposter syndrome. So when presented with someone else's comparatively grandiose accomplishment, you suddenly feel like yours was nothing and you put down your accomplishments as it was no big deal, when perhaps to you it was a pretty big deal. When you do this, you're guilty of using this diffident just. So I just ran the 5K. And perhaps in comparison to the 10K or half marathon, it does seem pretty inconsequential. But a 5K is still an accomplishment, especially for newer casual runners. Or perhaps a little closer to home. I just do lightning talks or sometimes meetups. I'm like, That's still impressive. Public speaking for any length of time in any type of venue is really hard. <laughs> and perhaps you struggle with imposter syndrome. It's easy to think that you're less than you are or that your abilities are less than they are. I'm just a developer. Well, guess what? <laughs> you are a developer. And you are skilled at what you do. So drop that just. And further, own your skills. You are an expert at building Rails applications. Or maybe you're just a boot camp graduate and you feel that your skills are weaker or less refined for someone who came from a more traditional background. Well, God's follow. You are still capable of building well protected software and web applications. So own your accomplishments. Be proud of them. Avoid using that diffident just that detracts from your own accomplishments and skills. I did a lightning talk. I ran a 5K. I am an expert software engineer. And then if you find yourself in a situation where you're the one with the so-called greater accomplishment, encourage them and praise them for their accomplishment. Nice job on that lightning talk. It takes guts to get up on the stage. Keep it up. 
And congrats on that 5K, you rocked it. So the diminutive just is a different than the diffident just because it's characterized by you diminishing others. This type of just presumes uh, puts on another or presumes that the other's feelings or actions are invalid or exaggerated. So this type of just is used often in regards to feelings, and it can often see, be seen perpetuating stigmas around mental illnesses. So mental illness disorder, such as depression or anxiety, are often diminished by phrases like, you're just sad, or you're just a nervous Nelly, or it's just in your head, or why can't you just be happy? Mental health order disorders affect approximately one in five adults in the United States. That's approximately 43.8 million people. So hearing you're just nervous or you're just sad, as this comic portrays, don't be sad, uh, is enough for feelings of guilt and worthlessness of those suffering from anxiety or depression disorders or other mental illness disorders to you know, have those feelings grow. And in some cases, it's enough to spin that person into an uncontrollable downward spiral. And these comments only few, further fuel their feelings of help and helplessness of not being able to help themselves. And yet, people still say these things and expect them to simply snap out of it. So if you're truly at a loss, tell them you don't understand. And then follow it up by telling them that you're there for them. Even if that means sitting in the same room with them and saying nothing. That can mean the world. And if you know that person well, you can also offer to do things you know that might help. Everyone has different triggers, and everyone has different ways to cope. Something like offering to bring them a book is helpful in a few ways. They'll know that you're there for them. They'll receive a potentially much needed physical proximity to another human being. And they'll receive a comforting object that can often break up that turmoil that's going on in their head. So one of my best friends copes with mental anxieties and depression by running. So she founded Still I Run as a way to create a community and surround herself by people who are suffering from the same thing, or people who are willing to help um, um, bring awareness to mental health illnesses. So when she's struggling with depression, she laces up her shoes and runs out the door. And then I have another friend who struggles from anxiety, and in the grips of an anxiety attack, she can forget to eat, or the very thought of making food or, off or having to order food and have a stranger come to her door is way too much. And there are other people who forget or to eat or miss meals simply because they're too depressed or too anxious to even think about it. So offer to make their favorite or most comforting food for them. So one of my favorite, all-time all -time favorite Harry Potter quotes is when Harry met his end at the, by the hand of Voldemort in the Forbidden Forest during the Battle of Hogwarts. Uh, when he went into the, like, that dreamlike state, Harry had asked Dumbledore if what he was experiencing was real or if it was just happening inside his head. And Dumbledore, a highly respected member of the Wizarding Society and a beloved character by many, stated that things that happen inside your head are as, as real as anything else you experience. So tip number four is watch your phrasing. So we've touched on phrasing a few times so far, but we're going to dive into it a little bit more now. So phrasing is a pretty broad term, so we're going to break it down into three types. Self-deprecating, stereotyped, and ambiguous. Self-deprecating phrasing, including self-deprecating humor, is harmful to you, to your psyche, and more likely based in falsehoods. These phrases often diminish your worth and weakens the perceptions of you to others. So how many times have you responded, I'm fine, wrote to the question, how are you? So these two words rank very high in the list of most used phrases. So how are you? I'm fine. Are you okay? I'm fine. Or what's wrong? I'm fine. It's a loaded phrase that can be interpreted in many different ways and will be interpreted differently depending on who you is on the receiving end. If you say you're fine even though you're doing great, people have no idea how content and happy you really are. So try answering how you really feel and see what conversations open up for you. I'm doing great. I'm fantastic. But then also be honest when your feelings are sad. Pretending all is fine when surely it isn't is doing you a disservice. And it can push your friends away when they observe that you're anything other than fine. So comparison phrases can also be self-deprecating. Talking down on yourself or your work because you feel someone else did a better job is also detrimental to your well-being and your self-confidence. You've already taken the first step to do that activity, and that's awesome. And no one is perfect at it the first time or even the tenth time or even the hundredth time. So if you're impressed with someone else's work, instead of comparing it to your, yours, compliment on theirs. And if you feel inclined, you can even ask for some tips to get better yourself. Or how about using derogatory of words or phrases because you're embarrassed by it? 
these types of phrases are harmful to you. And the term loony bin, for example, perpetuates the notion that mental health illnesses are only in your head or not real, or only for crazy people. So be honest about your experiences and help break down those barriers. You are in a mental hospital and that's okay. Or maybe you need to take meds for your mental illness in front of others. Well, medication is actually really extremely common. People take meds for all sorts of different ailments, so why is meds for depression or mental illness any different? All you need to say is you need to take your meds. If someone's curious and asks what for, you can clarify that it's for depression and anxiety. But making a fuss about it being your crazy meds is wildly inaccurate and harms your perspective of others and the perceptions other has of you. It's okay to need to take meds for any reason. So stereotype phrasing is phrases that commonly are commonly said but perpetuates stigmas or leaves persons or groups out. So phrases like ladies and gents, boys and girls, men and women, guys and gals are all have all leave person or person groups out. So instead use terms like all or everyone or folks to avoid unintentionally leaving groups of people that are outside of those binary buckets. Even Maui from Moana corrected himself. He initially said hero to men, but after a short pause, he amended his statement and said, and woman, men and woman, both, all, not a guy girl thing, you know, Maui is a hero to all. So the phrase man up perpetuates the stigma that a guy isn't a man or man enough, so he's belittled or shamed for showing emotion or crying or otherwise appearing weak. And similar to man up, phrases like you act like a girl or you run like a girl or you're such a girl all perpetuate the stigma that girls are weaker or the lesser than their counterparts. And it perpetuates that showing emotions and being weak or being unable to do something is, is the, is the um, things that girls do and not guys or others. And the phrases like that's gay is often used to describe things that are unpleasant or bad. And these perpetuate the stigma that stereotypes that gays or any other mem member of the LGBTQIA community are unpleasant or bad. So to start describing things as they are and remove those stereotype phrasings that are harmful to others and make you look ignorant. So ambiguous phrases are, are phrases that can be interpreted two or more ways. Occasionally the result is hilarious but taking a moment to think about what you really mean to say and then say it properly is probably in your best interest, especially if your job is in marketing or copywriting. This company, Sheets, made an entire marketing strategy around a defecation play on words. So in Harry Potter 4, Hermione is 11, just a Victor Crumb, a visiting student from another magical school. And when she was marking to Harry how her relationship with Victor was, she stated that he was more of a physical being. To which Harry assumed that he meant she meant physically intimate. And Harry Hermione, in reality, only meant that Victor was not particularly talkative and watched her study. So there are also phrases that are so vague or understating that you'd hardly know the event was catastrophic. So Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon remarked on his survival of the sinking of the Titanic with a simple, it was a, it was a serious evening. Well, it was a serious evening. Like, over a thousand people lost their lives on that ship. Or another example is during the Korean War when British Brigadier Tom Brody described the impossible odds of 650 to an estimated 10,000 as a bit sticky. Uh, and the Americans, unaware of the actual numbers, did not send reinforcements as they assumed that it couldn't be that bad based on Tom's message. So tip number five is praise in public, critique in private. The feedback loop, including both praise and critique, is important. And it's also important to note, or take the time to consider the implications of how we praise and how we critique each other. Both sides of the feedback go hand in hand, so this is tip is a little bit of a two for one. So praise in public and critique in private is a common adage among leadership and management, but I, find, I personally find this adage to have some unintended side effects when coming from the management level. And furthermore, that the praise and critique coming from a superior is understood and interpreted differently than when it comes from a peer. So therefore, this section is gonna focus on the peer praise and criticism between peers. And when praise and critique is done well at the peer-to-peer -peer level, you suddenly feel empowered by your team, and your team feels empowered by you. You are accountable together, you celebrate together, but then you also fall together. So praise is intrinsic to human nature. We crave praise and acknowledgement, and we want a receipt of our effort that we're, what we're doing and what we've done has been good. There's a certain amount of satisfaction from knowing that you did something fantastic. But unfortunately, we're all a little bit bad at giving 
and, or giving praise, and we fail to celebrate as a team when things go really well. So praise in its simplest form is recognition. We seek and appreciate that recognition. The work that we do and the work we accomplishment feels better, and we feel motivated to keep doing it when we are recognized for it. So praise is reward is specific to the praise that happens as recognition for the work that was done and done well. This can be as small as a pull request, or a well done pull request, or as big as a feature that a customer base or a client has been requesting for a really long time and is happy to have finally received. Well done, this is fantastic. Our customers are gonna really love this. And it can be as simple as a thanks for helping out on a feature. So praise as a motivator differs from that of a reward because the outcome might have been unexpected or otherwise fall short of expectations. So the purpose of praise as a motivator is to acknowledge that initial set of work, but then to empower them to grow and encourage them to keep doing it. I like to call this type of praise everyday praise because it's the stuff that's super simple to do, but it means the world to someone who's growing. So I really like how you did this. Can we do this over here? Oh, this is a great start, nice job. And these, this type of praise like, is great, but it also leaves that room for suggestions and improvements. Same with this statement. The main set of work was done, but now we need to follow up and solve some of those edge cases, which are a little bit harder to get to. Then it's important to note that we are praising the outcome of work and not the time it got, took to get there. And this is extremely important because there's a huge difference between praising for the time and praising for the work. So thanks for working late. Praise is the, com the time commitment for whatever activity they were doing. But praising someone for working late perpetuates that notion that working late or working long hours is how you get that recognition. Instead, you wanna praise the outcome. Praise that person regardless of whatever time it may have taken. This can help be helping a customer, staying a little bit late because the deploy went bad, whatever it might have been, that activity is what you want to be praising. So contrary to praising in public, Critique is best done in private. Remember, you're a team that empowers each other. And so it also means that as a team, you're responsible for keeping each other accountable, including criticizing when necessary. So as humans, when we see poor behavior, or more particularly when we're at the receiving end of that poor behavior, our natural tendency is to call it out and loudly. We want that person making us feel like crap to also feel like crap. So while critique is necessary, to the feedback loop and for growth, it's important to know how to handle and give that critique. So we're gonna be talking specifically about behavior-driven critique. This is when someone does something or says something that is inappropriate or mean or whatever, and then you witness it and wanna to respond to it. I mean, there are definitely times that vocal public critique is necessary, but before you do that, take that moment to think before you speak, because there's a good chance that a private reprimand is good enough to alert someone that their behavior was inappropriate. And critiquing publicly, especially out of emotion, often causes a twofold problem. When your emotions guide your response, you can look as foolish or even more foolish than the person you're critiquing for their behavior. Or your response can further escalate the encounter and only invoke defensive behavior of the one being critiqued. Remember that that person you're critiquing may not yet realize that what they said or did was wrong or bad. There are also times when people have or someone has repeatedly exhibited the same inappropriate behavior and has been told to stop repeatedly, it's okay to escalate in this sort of situation. So when you find yourself at the receiving end of critique, especially public critique, you may find yourself feeling like it's unjustified and your feelings are valid, but remember that their feelings are valid too. What you said evidently hurt them, then if you ignore it, you're gonna be worse off. So if you go in assuming that your feelings are more valid or that you are right and they're the ones being unreasonable, you'll find that anything you say is taken as a further insult. So take responsibility of your words and learn from the situation. Go into the conversation with an open mind and apologize. Say you're sorry and then make a learning moment. When you apologize, mean it. If you follow your apology with something like, I'm sorry your feelings were hurt, you're kind of doing it wrong. Remember, you're taking responsibility for your words, so apologizing that they are feeling hurt completely fails to take that responsibility. So feedback, both through praise and critique is important for growth. Without either, it's easy to become stagnant. You become un unmotivated to do any work because you feel unappreciated or because you're always told you're doing it wrong. So remember to think first and breathe before you're responding. Escalating leads to, can lead to mutual bad feelings that linger much longer than the actual encounter. And 
that's not great. <laughs> uh, moving conversations to private avenues allows for a safe place to understand that critique, consider it and learn from it and then grow from it. Public critique often invokes emo emotions that cloud that judgment and it often leaves to a person failing to learn what they did was wrong and why. So takeaways, we made it. So we talked about think then speak. By thinking before you speak, it stops you from saying things that is meant to be secret or not yours to share. It also stops you from saying things that you may regret later. So remember those three questions, what, who, and how. And dropping the knots improves understandability and, un and reduces the parsing complex complexity of negative statements. And dropping the just ensures you that you are, you're being kind to others by avoiding implying that you're elite or superior, and it also avoids putting others down. And they also enable you to own your accomplishments and abilities rather than diminishing them. And then watch how you phrase things as a, you are responsible for your words. Think about how your words will affect the people around you, including yourself. And phrase things in a way that avoids discriminating against other groups or implying incorrect meanings. And then remember that feedback in all forms is important for growth. Recognizing your team members for their accomplishments and critiquing them when necessary. So communication is hard. It'll take a lot of time to master these tips, but if you practice them and you, you, you know, in written communication or spoken communication, you'll eventually get really good at them. And I'm up here telling you about them because I think they're important and I have seen how they work well in my life and have improved my relationships with others. And if you're interested, these are some of the resources I used. Um, and then there's credits on all of the individual slides for the images. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.